Emma Benoit is gone, then no one has to think about her anymore. No one has to worry about her anymore. She's gone, and that's it. Now my one looks at her. Oh my God! Oh my daughter shot herself. Okay, is she breathing? Yes, ma'am, she's breathing. Stay with me, baby girl, please. I want you to say now. Every single time she takes a breath in. Now. 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 I didn't have a clue she was struggling. Seeing her in ICU, she looked broken completely. You start thinking immediately, where did I go wrong? Cheerleader, great grades in school, popular. Not Emma. They said, I may walk or I may not. They said, there's a 1% chance that I will. For as long as I can remember, I have struggled with anxiety and depression. Well, it's the first time I've ever admitted that. There is no age that is more likely to think about suicide and attempt suicide than high school kids. So welcome to Wellness Wednesday, everybody. Uh, today we have a special guest, Emma Benat. I would say Benat, is it? Benoit. Yeah, so today we have Emma to talk about and share her journey. So um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us, yeah. and give us, tell us your story. Yeah. So hi everyone, my name is Emma. Um, so my name is Emma Benoit and I am from South Louisiana. Um, a little backstory. Um, I was born and raised in the South of Louisiana. Haven't moved. That's all I've ever known. Um, and growing up, my childhood was seemingly picture perfect. Um, my parents were still married. My brother was my best friend. I traveled a lot for cheer competitions. I um, was really involved in that. And we took a lot of vacations. Um, and so seemingly there was nothing wrong with my life on the exterior. Um, however, on the interior was a whole different story. Um, from, as, from as early as I can remember, I've struggled with anxiety um, and have gone through several bouts of depression as a child. Um, looking back, um, anxiety was never something that I was fully aware of. I didn't really even know how to identify that feeling. I just knew that I felt anxiety and I just knew that I felt um, really overwhelmed and really anxious as a child. And then growing up, um, obviously problems become bigger. So anxieties become larger um, and not really understanding what that feeling looks like or how to cope with that feeling or what to do with that feeling. Um, I just in turn swept it all under the rug and became um, kind of put it on a facade for I was just always trying to protect my perception of like the picture perfect life that I wanted others to see me having. Um, so therefore I was never honest or open about how my true struggles and my true feelings because I was always afraid of the judgment or the stigma or um, anything negative that would come from me sharing my authentic feelings um, was what I was afraid of and that kind of trapped me into staying silent. Um, so like I said, I've struggled with anxiety since I was a kid in elementary school. And then as I got older, anxieties become more and um, not really ever expressing those feelings with anyone really became um, a lot to bear and a lot of weight for me to carry. Um, and then so, you know, getting into high school and not really having um, coping skills to take with me or um, understanding how to regulate my emotions um, was, detrimental for me um, and ultimately led up to my suicide attempt when I was 16 years old. Um, and prior to my suicide attempt, there was no talk about mental health, much less suicide in general. Um, in my community, it wasn't ever something that was brought to the light or brought to the surface. Um, so I was completely in the dark with it. I thought I was the only one that was suffering and struggling with these thoughts um, and these feelings. Um, so therefore, I was afraid and ashamed of those feelings because I thought I was alone in them. Um, so that's kind of what reserved me from speaking out about my, of my struggles. And then um, all of that combined it into a suicide attempt, which I, by the grace of God, have made it out of and mm -hmm. have, you know, found greater purpose in sharing my story and then, you know, providing hope to the hopeless. Um, so all in all, the journey has been a really really hard one, really long, challenging one, but it's one that I'm grateful for. And I um, live every day of my life now just trying to spread the message of hope and to eradicate youth hopelessness as a whole.
Um, so that's a little bit about me. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you struggled in anxiety mm -hmm. and you remember since you were a kid. Yeah. So how far back are you talking about? So the earliest things I can remember about probably in high school, uh, not high school, take that back. Probably in elementary school is whenever I started feeling these feelings of anxiety. Um, I didn't really know what they were. I just knew that I felt wrong. I knew that I had a really bad feeling, um, which I now know to be anxiety. But on a daily basis in elementary school, I can remember, you know, we had to line up to go to the bathroom and I was always so anxious to stand up because I was afraid, you know, that the other kids would be looking at my butt. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that I still to this day can vividly recall that feeling of not wanting to stand up in front of my classmates because I was afraid of them looking at me or them judging me. Mm -hmm. um, so that anxiety started, like I said, in elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was very early. I mean, that was the earliest stages of my anxiety. And then, you know, as I grew, my problems grew with me mm -hmm. um, and my stressors grew with me too. So um, having that underlying anxiety, not knowing what it is, not knowing how to approach it, not knowing how to cope with it, um, is a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we looked at your story, mm -hmm. right? Um, you were popular. Mm -hmm. You were on the cheerleading mm -hmm. squad. Mm -hmm. um, your grades were good. Mm -hmm. You have a, a, a great home, right? Your mother and father are still married. You have, a, a, you know, a, a one brother, yeah. right? So when we look at the perfect family, mm -hmm. right, from the outside, I mean, why you know how is it that we can see or what is it that you know makes that different that you know that there is a problem or how is you know when we look at the picture as a whole mm -hmm. and everything looks perfect mm -hmm. you know from the outside but you know aside from you know the struggles of just anxiety from when you were young um what else was going on i mean again everything looks perfect but what else is going on that's causing you mm -hmm. know this anxiety you know that obviously something that hasn't right. happened yet. But. Right. So for me, as early as I can remember, and this is before I can remember having those anxious moments in school, um, I've always dealt with the extreme like perfectionist mentality. I've mm -hmm. always been so hard on myself, hard to the point of it, it's impossible. Some of the goals that I was setting for myself were impossible, um, unachievable. And yet I was, that was the standard that I was trying to live mm -hmm. up to. That was the standard that I was trying to appear to be upholding. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely overly critical of myself from as early as I can remember. Um, extremely hard on myself, extremely mean to myself. Mm -hmm. In general, I was just so ugly to myself, um, very self-deprecating. Um, so I, and I think that all that stemmed from me not feeling like I had a purpose, me not feeling like I had a place in this life. Mm -hmm. um, I think those insecurities kind of stem from that. Um, and then, you know, not having any direction, you know, with school or, you know, what I want to do when I get older or mm -hmm. anything like that, it just becomes, it just becomes a lot. And, you know, while having all this pressure on myself and then, you know, the outside pressures from school and peers and all these things, you know, it just became way too much. And it was honestly way too overwhelming for me to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the root of my problems came from my own feelings of insecurity, mm -hmm. my own, you know, not having a self-worth, not feeling like I was valuable. Mm -hmm. So those were, that's where I would attest all my other feelings that followed. That's probably where they came from was just that right. underlying feeling of not feeling like I was worth anything. Mm -hmm. And so, and obviously things have just, you know, it's like a domino effect. Yeah. It just got bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, we know that stressors come from different places, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, so there wasn't any one particular place that was coming from me. It was really from all no, angles. And that's the thing is there's not one thing that I can attribute my attempt to. There's not mm -hmm. one reason that stands out as to what would lead me to do something like mm -hmm. that. Um, it was a combination of, mm -hmm. of factors that played, took part. Right. And we talked earlier about it wasn't planned. Mm -mm, it was not. Um, and that's the craziest thing when I tell people that, you know, that they're, that it wasn't planned, that it was impulsive. It was one of the most impulsive things I've ever done. And to this day, I carry regret with it because mm -hmm. had I just 
let go of the shame that I was feeling. Mm -hmm. I had to just let go of the assumptions that I was making about the way others would perceive me mm -hmm. and just been honest and open about my feelings. It could have saved me a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, and it could have saved a lot of other people, a lot of fear um, in my life too. So it could have been prevented. And I think that's so what I need to, what I feel like is so important to capitalize on is the fact that suicide is 100% preventable. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's just a matter of being honest with yourself and understanding, you know, that we're all human mm -hmm. and we're all going through this life together. And my human experience might look different than yours, but that doesn't mean that we can't be there for one another and that we can't, you know, support one another. So um, had I just felt that, had I just known that to be the truth, things might have looked a little different for me. Right. Um, right. Yeah. It, I mean, it's hard, you know, from looking from the outside and, you know, especially going through the attempt, you mm -hmm. know, we just kind of assume mm -hmm. that there was a plan. Right. You know, or the thoughts have been there previously, right. but they weren't. The thoughts were never there. I had never, you know, actively thought of, you know, how I was going to hurt myself. I never actually thought about, you know, life with that. Like, uh, I never thought about the act of me actually dying. Mm -hmm. I just always thought of, I'm just so exhausted. That was a common thought and that would reappear in my mind was, I'm just so exhausted of putting up a facade. I'm mm -hmm. so tired of faking, you know, happiness for everyone. So that way they don't think that anything's wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm so tired of, you know, claiming to be perfect when I'm actually not claiming to be okay when I'm actually hurting. Mm -hmm. I was so tired of faking my life um, that I just kind of wanted to throw in the towel. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't ever something that I actively put a lot of thought into. Mm -hmm. It was not something that was truly deeply planned. Mm -hmm. It was just, I was just overcome with exhaustion and to the point where it started to affect me physically. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know any other way to eliminate my problems other than to eliminate myself as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so to say that my suicide attempt was thought out and planned would be false mm -hmm. because it wasn't. Right. Um, the method in which I chose was the only method that crossed my mind. I'm not, that should, you know, capitalize on the fact that I, it wasn't thought out because right. if that was the first thing I thought of, that's the first thing I did, then clearly it wasn't a thought out plan. Um, because that was truly the first method that I thought to use was mm -hmm. my dad's nine millimeter in the nightstand because I knew it was there and I knew how to use it. Mm -hmm. And it would just seem like the quickest, most painless way to go right. and eliminate myself from my reality. Right. Um, so in terms of planning, from my experience, there was no planning. Yeah. And it just happened. And which is interesting, the method mm -hmm. um, that you chose, which is more male dominated, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the one that's usually most successful. Mm -hmm. And thankfully it wasn't. Yes. Um, Praise God. Yeah. So, it, and, but again, going through that process and you were just exhausted. Mm -hmm. It's like, so, and it, it's interesting to hear that, um, and in a good way from the outside, mm -hmm. thinking about that it's not such a long thought process, mm -hmm. not for everybody. Right. You know? I mean, Everyone it's, it's different experience. for everybody. Right. Um, but the fact is, is that, um, you know, how much more troubled an individual could be when that's all they think about. Right. And they're planning and plan it till eventually they do. Right. Um, so it, you know, but again, obviously there were signs. Yes. Not necessarily suicidal signs, which it's not, and actually really the signs, it doesn't really matter. Right. Um, you know, when we're dealing with behavioral health, it, it doesn't have to, these signs don't necessarily say, Oh, this is anxiety or this is, I mean, you know, depression or what have, there are some, but for the most part, they're generalized, mm -hmm. you know, so anger was one. Yeah, absolutely. Acting out was one too. I was very rebellious mm -hmm. towards the end or towards the end, T leading up to my attempt, I was showing signs of mm -hmm. major rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just extremely irritable. I was very irritable. Nothing made me, nothing pleased me. Yeah. Um, I was very um, aggressive with my deliverance and the way that I was approaching people and approaching things, just aggression was very prevalent in my life um, leading up. And then obviously, you know, acting out bad behaviors right. was uh, definitely a cry for help. I didn't realize it then. Right. Right. 
Um, and but as, I and now as know. parents, we don't either because exactly. we think this is, you know, typical teenage behavior. behavior. Right. Yeah. It, 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 you know it all. Right. We know nothing yep. as a parent, and so we assume it is typical behavior. Right. Um, but sometimes it's not. not. It's not. So, and again, it's finding that fine line. You know, when is it typical behavior? When is it right? You know, but obviously it got to a point where um, you weren't functioning, right? Mm -hmm. It started to affect you physically, you mentioned. Yeah. So my attempt was the summer going into my senior senior year of high school. Um, so it was in June and we go back to school in August. So I had just got out of school in May and I was taking a trip with a local photographer up to New York City for three days. We were going to do shoots and um, take photos and just have a fun time. Um, I was a senior rep for her photography company in my local area. Um, and so that kind of, I already previously had a lot of other things going on at home. Um, my life was in shambles. And as a 16 year old, it was the end of the world for me yeah. um, because of the things that I was dealing with. Um, so getting to go on that trip, it was an escape and it was kind of a band aid, mm -hmm. um, temporary concealing of the pain that I was living in. Um, so going on that trip and then coming, you know, home, you know, going from such a high to such a low and such short amount of time, mm -hmm. um, I really, and then on top of that, not really understanding how to process emotion, not really understanding how to identify emotion either. So having all these, you know, happy, happy, happy feelings, mm -hmm. being on this trip and then coming home and being like completely low, right. you're crashing. I'm like, why, what is happening? Like, am I crazy? Am mm -hmm. I actually crazy? And that was my thought process. I, I genuinely thought I was crazy. Yeah. And so that, so even, you know, sometimes it's difficult for, I'll say kids, but teens or, yeah. or, or, Youth. or people in general yeah. to talk to, you know, a parent or to a teacher or a counselor, what have you to reach out. Um, but even amongst your peers, your friends, your immediate friends, there wasn't any talk at all about your feelings. I mean, we talk about the cute boys yeah, and you yeah. know the pretty dress and the party and yeah. all that but nothing um no because honestly the little world that i was living in my bubble everyone was perfect mm -hmm. everyone was perfect so if you say something that's anything but good or perfect or it then you're just like an outcast you're just weird mm -hmm. like because no one struggled from, from what they portrayed, I know, obviously, you know, that that's not real life right. and you right. have, you know, you have your, you have your stuff. Um, but they didn't portray any of it. Only thing that they portrayed was the positive and the good. Mm -hmm. Um, so therefore it made me feel pressured to only put out the good in my life. And whenever there's not really much good, then you have to fake good. And that doesn't feel good either. Right. Right. Cause then you're lying, you yeah. know, you're, it's a facade. Yeah. And that um, dive, that high dive yeah. also, you yeah. know, at the end, you know, might, might even start to feel good for a minute, but then it, reality it is off. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, talk us through the day. So you said the week before you were in New York, mm -hmm. which at the time was probably amazing. Yeah. It was fabulous. <laughs> Maybe not, you know, so this was pre COVID. Yeah. Um, and, and so now you're home, you're home, um, Back to reality. Back to reality. Yeah. So I, we took that trip and it was three days. Um, and then I came home and keep in mind that whenever I had left the trip, there had already been some turmoil in the household. Um, already been some, um, discipline that was enforced on me for something that I had done. And I was just already in a mess of everything. Um, and then going into the summer, you know, I was one of my freedoms and I had just got my license and, you know, this was the time that I was going to, you know, go all out and live my best life. And then I got in trouble and, you know, it was just, nothing was working out. And obviously for a 16 year old girl, getting her car taken is the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a lot of turmoil back at home. Um, so that trip kind of minimized it a little bit, but then coming home to it really amplified. It was amplified mm -hmm. from when I left, it was amplified when I got back because I had just experienced such a high and I was coming back down to such a low um, that I just didn't, I was, I was just over trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I was just over trying to figure it out for myself. I was just lit and the best way that I can put it is just tapping out. Right. Throwing right. in the towel. And yet, even though some of the signs were there mm -hmm. with the anger and the lashing out and all mm -hmm. that, still nobody believed. 
that you could have done that. No, it wasn't even on anyone's radar. No one said, oh, it was obvious that yeah. I should have I, I should have reached out last weekend or I should have said something. Yeah. I knew she was having trouble. There was none of that. No, because it was it wasn't even on anybody's radar. And that's that's just so bizarre to me. Yeah. Um the fact that it was on not a single person's radar. Um that that's still shocking to me. But yeah. the shock wave that it brought to my community was like insane. I mean Yeah, people were just floored when yeah. they heard my name with that. Because mm -hmm. you just, you know, not my daughter. Yeah, right. Not my family or mm -hmm. my friend, um, especially when everybody was blindsided. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's hard to say, oh, mm -hmm. this was why. Right. This mm -hmm. makes sense. This, th there's none of that. Nope. And I think, I think in the beginning, you know, at post attempt, there was a lot of people searching for reasons because people want to have a reason for something. Sure. They got to have a reason. It's got to make sense. It's got to make sense. It can't be not like, you, yeah, you got to find a reason for everything. Um, and so they were searching for reasons. Um, By they, setting up for disappointment. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that, that was really tough because yeah. unfortunately there was a, combination of reasons that led up to my attempt mm -hmm. and there's no one person that I'm blaming right there's no one person to blame for my attempt right it's a combination of things right um so but there was a lot of searching for you know the reason why this could happen to you know a person like Emma yeah I mean I guess it kind of makes us feel better that we can pinpoint yeah you know and I can see that and as a parent oh, yeah. we want to know what we did wrong absolutely yeah you know when it doesn't have to have anything to do with that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've talked to your mom. She mm -hmm. sounds great. Yeah, you know? my, yeah, my parents are amazing. I mean, they're still married. They're still very happy. I mean, my mom's the wind beneath my wings. My dad's the rock I stand on. So mm -hmm. my parents are my best my best people. Mm -hmm. um, and still. Yeah. I mean, my mom and I took so many trips together, just her and I. And still. Yeah. There was nothing. Because it wasn't even on her mind. It wasn't even on her radar. Sure. And I think that that's what's so important about making this, you know, the topic of suicide and mental health more prevalent and spreading the awareness is mm -hmm. so that, you know, for instance, it's like my life, you know, like, let's say there's someone that's just like me with parents just like mine, you know, who are throwing out many cries for help, many warning signs, but, you know, the parents don't even think to no. think about it. You know, it's just, it's got to be something that's in the brain because it's yeah yeah it's and we don't and and the thing with suicide is that um it doesn't latch on to a particular geographical location mm -hmm. doesn't matter how big and beautiful your home is or yeah. how small um mm -hmm. and inadequate your home, home might be it does not discriminate nope you know and it is the second leading cause of death amongst our youth mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what age group you look at um, whether it's a 12 to 17 or 10 to 34, 34. I mean, there's so many, all at the end of the day, it's still second leading cause of death. Yeah. And it's something that's preventable. 100% preventable. So, you know, accidents, of course, is the number one leading cause of death. That is an accident. Yeah. You can't control, you know, other drivers. You can't control um, weather. Conditions there's on the road. You no. can't control some of those things. But suicide is 100% preventable. So it's yeah. a matter of just, reaching out. Yep. Having the resources, ask the questions. Yes. Ask the question because yeah. that'll take that, that whenever you ask the question, it's going to completely disdain mm -hmm. the whole world of suicide and mental health. It's just that there's a stain on it right now. Yeah. There's a huge stain on it. And it's like, it's almost like we're all walking on eggshells around it. Yeah. Um, but we're making headway. So I'm, you know, we're not completely far back like we were, we're definitely more open and um, the young generation, yes. the Z generation is definitely more open to mental health, which is a beautiful thing. Yeah, I'm very proud of that. Very so that. that's exciting. Um, you know, it's us as parents that are still working on, mm -hmm. you know, that it's not my child. Yeah. Um, it can't happen, you know, to why, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense. Um, but that's the thing. It doesn't have to make sense. Mm -hmm. And know? I think too, like something, you know, just going back to my life and my experience, it's like, you know, I would have been like, let's, let me give you an example. So 
around homecoming time, you know, that's the happy time of, you know, any high school girl's life, you know, you get hair done, makeup done, you know, nails, dress, heels, you know, all that, plans, stuff like that. So that's a happy time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I can remember my going into my sophomore year, homecoming, that was one of the lowest times of my life. I was so down. I was mm -hmm. so low. Um, it I should be exciting. Yeah, it should be exciting. Yeah. And I presented it to be exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and I hated myself. I really did. I didn't like myself. Mm -hmm. um, but no one knew that. Um, so I think, you know, it's not always because I, I know that I was never one to show obvious signs of how I was actually feeling. Mm -hmm. And there are kids like me who are stubborn and who are not going to open up and who are just going to keep everything to themselves because they think that they're strong enough and they can handle it because that was me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think something that really would have helped is if my mom just checked in, like, hey, how are you? Mm -hmm. Even if I look super happy or like super on top of the world and everything's fine and there's nothing wrong, if she would have just maybe said, you know, when, I'm, when I look like I'm at my highest, hey, are you okay? Like, mm -hmm. how are you today? How are we feeling? Mm -hmm. Then I would have been like, whoa. Yeah. Like, she sees me. She sees me. Like, she sees me. Right. Right. Which is hard. It's very, I mean, communication is the most important tool. Yeah. Um, and communication is hard. It is hard. And again, sometimes people are really good about setting an image. Mm -hmm. So even, and you mentioned you and your mom have a great relationship. Yeah. And so imagine the facade that she saw. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I mean, I, I think about that to this day and that's part of the reason why I don't blame anyone for my attempt yeah. Yeah. is because it wasn't anybody's fault. Yeah. It was no one's fault. And, you know, that's kind of the trickiest part about, you know, suicide prevention and mental health in general is the fact that there is such a stigma around it. And mm -hmm. there are so many reservations in one's mind when it comes to being vocal about their feelings, Yeah, the dark feelings. Yeah. But there are, it, they're, they have no issues being vocal on social media. Right. <laughs> so, um, and this is one of the things that we talk about and we see daily um, social media, you know, is a wonderful tool, um, but at the same time can be extremely damaging. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're always looking at the highlight reel. Everybody's life yeah. is amazing. The filters mm -hmm. that they use are beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but yet there, you know, we're still, um, basing our self-esteem and our self-worth based on how many likes, mm -hmm. um, how many views, who's actually saying, having some comments. And we don't even know everybody that's on. Yeah. And I mean, I don't. I mean, I know <laughs> I, that I probably like a quarter of the percent of people I that I follow on social media, I personally know. It, yeah. So, so that, I mean, that right there is enough to tell you that you don't know these people's lives. Right. You don't know what they're going through. Right. So imagine the pressures you have your own built-in anxiety because that is your life. That, yeah. That's your makeup. That's how you were born because mm -hmm. um, we we're born one way. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the pressures of your surroundings, mm -hmm. your home, mm -hmm. your school, mm -hmm. and then social media just throws that wrench right in there. Yeah, it makes it all much better. Because once in the cloud, always in the cloud. Yes, ma'am. That yeah. is so true. So you can't take it out. Mm -hmm. um, so what might have been a really small little blip mm -hmm. in your life at that moment is now huge. huge. Yeah, the biggest huge. ordeal ever. And that's kind of the times that are, it's just crazy to see how the times are so different, yeah. um, especially whenever we're approaching things like mental health and the youth, um, because social media is huge. Yeah. It's massive. And I, and I would attribute social media to a lot of, you know, mental illnesses and a lot of, sure. you know, depressive, you know, stages that people go through and, you know, extreme anxieties, um, I would att attest it to social media because it's, it can be so damaging. Yeah. That's um, how we validate. Yeah. It's, and it's, you know, such an old quote that I use religiously is that comparison is the greatest thief of joy, mm -hmm. um, which is the most true statement, especially in terms of social media, Yeah, because that is the number one thing that I know I'm guilty of, um, going on social media, comparing myself. <laughs> Um, well, well, who else are we going to compare? Well, it's to? like, yeah, you're going on, you know, you're having a kind of a bad day. You go on. It's like, okay, you see, you know, someone my age graduated college. I'm like, well, I'm not even in college. So <laughs> yeah. what does that mean? how does that make me? Right. So then it's like you internalize all the things. So then it's like, 
well, what does that say about me? Like what, you know, so then you start to self-deprecate and have these negative feelings toward yourself when you're seeing something that someone posted mm -hmm. um, because you're comparing. So right. that comparison factor is definitely, I feel like the biggest piece, negative piece about social media is yeah. the, the comparison that we all kind sure. of fall, fall victim to. You know, it's always keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah, right. Absolutely. You know, we're always trying to keep up. Um, and why is it not perfect? What did we do wrong mm -hmm. that we don't have that vacation right. or, you know, whatever it may be, how come we don't have that car? Why are we not going, you know, why were we not invited? Mm -hmm. That's something too. That's huge. I know, especially in like high school, that was a big yeah. thing for me is like, yeah. you know, social media is like the continuation of school drama. Yeah, it really is. And like, I can, I mean, and I hate that this is the truth. But girls are mean. Girls can be mean. Yeah. And um, I, it just is. It's social media is not. It's not a good tool. Yeah. For mean girls, and it's it. And I know that you know that that's still a reality for a lot of you mm -hmm. know high school. Like, you know, I know that that dynamic is still existing in high yeah. school. Um, but social media doesn't doesn't help at all. No, no. I mean, it unfortunately, exasperates it, and it doesn't go away. Mm -mm. So you saw it today. You'll see it tomorrow. You'll and see yeah. it five years from now. No, you're gonna yeah. see that same thing. Yeah. And which was could have been the most horrible time uh -huh. in your life. Yeah. So like your mistakes are highlighted, and then they're never gonna disappear. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm grateful for not living in that generation. Yes, be um, yes you know, because whatever, you know, um, argument we had amongst our friends or if we didn't get invited or whatever it might have been, it ended. Yeah. The end of the day was done and you then home, it was and Friday it was like, night, then Monday you forgot about yeah. it. But here now it's on this constant reel mm -hmm. and then you start seeing pictures yeah. of the party that you weren't invited yeah. to. And then you might have comments about why you weren't invited, uh -huh. right? Which are probably almost all false. Yeah. Um, but we start to believe it. Yep. We see it, we believe it. Um, and so you're adding that pressure in addition to everything else that's going on. Mm -hmm. And then too, like the generational thing of like, I feel like most Gen Z and millennials, we, I don't know what it is, but we always put, so much pressure on ourselves mm -hmm. um and i and i see that you know across the board with people in my age group um it's just the, the the need to feel like you have everything together all the time it just is insane and yeah. so you know when you're adding all of the external pressures from you know life itself and then you know the internal pressures that we're putting on ourselves right. it's like a recipe for disaster and it's 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 hard yeah it's hard to exist like that well life is hard Absolutely. in general um, and we have to work at it. Yeah. So, it, and it, and it should be, you know, yeah. just part of living. Yeah. Right. And we want to excel. We want to, we, we want to achieve our goals, whatever they might be. Right. And they're not the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but yet we still compare. Yeah. You know, even though you might have no interest whatsoever to go to Harvard, but you're right. You know, someone went to Harvard. Why did you not get in? Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, and I went through that. I went through mm -hmm. that with, with one of my kids. They had no interest to go to a particular school, but they didn't get in and they could not believe that they didn't get in. Yeah. And so it's this pressure that they don't even want it. Mm hmm but yet you feel like you have to achieve it. You have to get it. So it, it, there's just a lot. Um, and in high school is hard. Yeah, high school is extremely tough. I would say that it was the hardest time of my life, mm -hmm. high school, those high school years. Um, well, it's big. It's I mean, it is big because you are coming into yourself. Yes. As a high school student, as that um, mid-teen, um, you're finding your ways, mm -hmm. you know, and you're finding your group and your, your, friend, your yeah. you know, your, your true friends, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and there's a lot of pressure. Um, and now the, the schools put a lot of pressure with AP classes because you just might not be smart enough when right. you're in college or finish a year early. I'm not sure right. what the whole reasoning behind it. Um, of why they implement college level classes in high school? I mean, maybe for bragging rights, my kids have six AP classes this I mean, school year. I'm not sure. I don't know, honestly, because a lot of my friends that 
you know, cram themselves and stress themselves out like crazy over these AP classes and um, things like that are at the same level as me yeah. these days. So it, it's keeping up. Yeah. And again, pressures from, and I'm not, trust me, I'm not blaming the schools um, because it's pressures from everywhere. Yeah. All because directions. the parents are also pushing the kids yeah, to take them. Absolutely. Um, and again, back in the day, which, you know, I could be your mom. So um, we probably had maybe 1% of the population was in honors. Oh, wow. It, it wasn't, wasn't that like now, you know, because truly the gifted, what percentage do you really think are the gifted? Mm -hmm. They're there, they do exist, um, but it's not the majority of the people and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it doesn't, you don't need to take, you know, these crazy calculus classes mm -hmm. if you're not going to be an architect. <laughs> no, and that's the thing that I think is so crazy about, you know, the dynamics of Americanized high school is, well, we could, that's a whole other rant for one other day. My point is that there was a whole class freshman year that was required to take called career readiness, mm -hmm. career readiness. Mm -hmm. And basically the curriculum of that class was to figure out what you're going to do in college and mm -hmm. then what you're going to do for a job after college. So it was structured to help you find what you're interested in, only things that they offer at college. At the age of 14? At the age of 14, mm -hmm. some 13, because some people enter high school at 13 and then turn 14. Mm -hmm. um, so, but all of the options were surrounding a, a university. So there was nothing for beautician or mechanic or mm -hmm. um, public speaker or storyteller or anything like, yeah, nothing like that. It was only college, like, college stuff yeah. um, and that class was required it was a whole block and it was just it was completely pointless to me yeah. like I thought I still to this day I think it's so pointless like they should replace that class with like a mental health advocate mm -hmm. advocacy class or something mm -hmm. like something to you know implement that in schools um but anyways like I said that's a whole other thing for another <laughs> day um but no so definitely it was pushed you know to go above and beyond, you know, yeah. when you're starting school. Which is interesting because we've gotten rid of the life skills classes. Yeah. And we talked about this earlier about yeah. home ec, which I took in seventh grade. Yeah, no, that wasn't a thing. And in, in seventh grade, we, we had a choice. You took home ec or um, uh, what was the other one? Shop. What shop? Yeah, yes. we don't do that anymore. Yes. Um, and that was it. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you had to have those life skills. You had to know how to cook. Mm -hmm. um, and we all eat. So yeah. how important is that skill? Yeah. Especially um, for kids that are transitioning to, to college, mm -hmm. going from high school to college, that now they're moving away. Yeah. If they don't have the basic skills, I mean, they, I guess they could eat out. You're, you're, you'll survive. You could eat out every day. Yeah. But that's but, not really equipping no. a future adult for real life. No. Um, and I think that's the biggest downfall of, you know, public schools and schools in general in America is the fact that it's not equipping young people to right. live life as an adult. Right. Um, yeah, we, we definitely need to do a better job of looking at everything as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how we function. Mm -hmm. You know, these life skills are extremely important. Um, even if it's not cooking, maybe you just don't want to cook at all. Um, and, and that would be okay too, but it, there's so many other things that we just, you know, did they teach you how to write a check mm -mm. in school? Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> now I know they're almost obsolete. Um, you don't need a check anymore because I you could just remember. Venmo or anything else. But the idea, you know, we're, we're getting rid of all these um, areas where eventually we're, we're not going to have any communication with people. Well, it's like financial literacy. Why is that not a class anymore? Like that is so important to yeah. know like how to file taxes. What does it tax season look like? Like I just filed my taxes <laughs> and I'm like, like, obviously it was complete. Like I have never, I've never experienced that before. So I was yeah. like, I felt like a toddler going into file taxes. I'm like, I don't know what this means. And she was like telling me all these things that I should have been doing all year long. And I'm like, I had no idea. Yeah. Like I could have saved a lot of money if yeah. I had just known these small things that are, I feel like should be taught in schools, yeah. but they're not. So so you're pressured to maintain a certain image. Right. And be ahead of the game. Yeah. And know, you know, algebra. Yeah. Yeah. 
but yet, you know, again, day to day things you lose sight of. Um, so with all that pressure, you know, added to the anxiety you already had, mm -hmm. and then, you know, that leads to, you know, just a lot, a lot going on, yeah. especially when you don't have the resources. Uh, yeah. So what, um, what do you think could have helped make a difference? You know, what were you missing aside from that communication, even within your home? But mm -hmm. it's, you know, it takes a village Absolutely. to raise our kids. Um, so what else do you feel that could have helped you and that might have changed your the trajectory? Yeah. Having that those resources accessible to me. Mm -hmm. um, granted, I don't know if those resources were in existence during those times. Um, yeah, they, very, they very well might have been there, Yeah. Um, but I didn't know about them. Yeah. So having known about the resources that were out there mm -hmm. um, would have made a difference Yeah. Um, because then it would have made me feel like I wasn't crazy. Right. Because honestly, I was the only, I, like everything that I was going through mentally, I kept myself. Mm -hmm. So all of my, you know, I thought I was crazy. I thought I was the only one that was struggling like this, but I was the only one that was having these deep thoughts, you know, like. I, my thoughts would spiral, like they would just like spiral, like I would make a, like a D on a test, mm -hmm. right? And then I would be like, oh, well, I failed this test, so then I'm not going to pass the final. And if I don't pass the final, then I'm not going to pass, you know, my entry level for college. And if I don't do that, then I'm not going to get into college. And if I don't, it just um, keeps going. It's, yeah, it's like continuous. And it's like all these negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's anxiety. Like I literally like was the epitome of anxiety. Like I was always worried about what hasn't even come yet. Yeah. Um, and so having the resources, you know, presented to me or even like just knowing that they exist, maybe it would have made me feel like I'm not the only one that feels like this. Yeah. Maybe I'm not like, maybe it would have made me feel like I'm not the only person that's gone through something like yeah. this, you know, these feelings, these thought patterns. And this is why we here at the Book and Bell House, we're very, um, you know, big about communicating in the schools. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, again, with, with this generation being extremely open to mental health. And I do think that we're making some, yeah, wait, some movement. Yeah. You absolutely. know, the, the stigma is still there, yeah. unfortunately, but yes. I think people are becoming more open and aware of, you know, we still want to say it's not my child. Um, but, um, you know, our talks that we are sharing in the schools and talking about certain things that are trending because today it's anxiety, tomorrow it's vaping, yeah. or it's cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. um, there are disorders or whatever. There's so many things that we tie, you know, it, it, it's a never ending, um, you know, cycle and mission, but it, they're, they're there. Yeah. So it's a matter of talking and having the resources because um, they do exist. Mm -hmm. It's just they're not readily available right. all the time. Right. Um, and so as we continue to, you know, raise awareness, um, you know, ha we all need that wellness check-in. Absolutely. We need to check in, see where are we today? Mm -hmm. You know, because as you know, we could be our number one critic. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I know so, I am. Yes. And so um, we need to check in. And but we need to sit back and relax, take that break. Yes, absolutely. You know, we need to um, be able to just absolutely not focus on anything except for whatever it is you're, you're doing to decompress, mm -hmm. relax. Um, so whether, you know, we talk about how you, you, you like to meditate. Mm -hmm. I can't, um, it's just not in my nature. <laughs> it's just, it's just soothing for me. It's, it's, it's a way to self-soothe. Which is wonderful. Uh -huh. Um, and, and these are the things that we need to investigate as an yeah, individual, absolutely. figure out what works for you, mm -hmm. whether it is meditating, whether it is reading, um, reading, going outside, you know, going for a walk around mm -hmm. the block. Um, going for a swim, yeah. um, anything that actually gets you to not focus on anything itself, it, uh, you know, outside of whatever it is that it you're is. working on. Right. Cooking. Yeah. I love cooking. Yeah. I, I don't like cleaning, but I like cooking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever that case may be, but it's finding that what works for you. And mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be the same all the time. So you don't have to make it a job, you know, because sometimes yeah. when you continue, you're like, oh, I have to do this and it becomes right. a job and then you might not like it. But so, change it up yeah um, and that's what i was gonna say too i don't just meditate i mean i'm always joking <laughs> no, i know I, but i um i recently actually just got into meditation so i'm a newbie at that but um one of my favorite things to do whenever i'm trying to decompress or just trying to self-soothe is drive 
Mm -hmm. I love to go on drives. Um, mm -hmm. Keep like put all the windows down. No, no music. Just drive. Um, sometimes the music is helpful too. But um, so yeah, yeah there, there's a number. There's there's I guarantee you there's things out there for you mm -hmm. that are going to be your release. Yeah. You just have to find them. Yeah. And it's and it's not that hard. No, it's not. It's really it's not. really not that hard because anything that forces you to focus on and not realize anything that else that's going on around you, reading a book, mm -hmm. um, doodling. Yeah, it really anything that just brings you joy. Yeah, that just brings you just unfiltered, unproblematic, just joy. Yeah, like just makes you like, oh, that's yeah. nice. You know, do more of that. Exactly. Not drugs. We're not gonna do that. We're not no. promoting drugs. No, no. You know, there's just so much um, natural, you know, um, exciting things that you can do. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of things that actually give you, you know, releases those yeah. endorphins yeah. anyway. Certain foods that you eat, exercising, of course, um, you know, all that gives you that same healthy excitement. Mm -hmm. um, it's just finding it, you know, finding yep. what works for you. So what's next? What's I, next for us? Okay. Um, so actually, I still reside in Louisiana, which is kind of a bummer after seeing this beautiful place. Um, <laughs> I'm convinced that we're going to move here soon. But I actually have a job at a local magazine company called Badner's Parents Magazine, and I oversee the production team. So I'm the production manager. Um, so I just oversee graphics, editorial, and all the design work that goes into the publications that we do. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. It's very laid back, family oriented. My boss is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really nice. nice. Um, and then on the side of that, I share my story. I'm a big traveler. I love to travel. Um, and it's a plus whenever I get to travel and share my story. Mm -hmm. um, so I love to do that. Um, and then on top of that, I do have a documentary film called My Ascension that uh, I've been working on for the last three years with a local producer named Greg Sherry. Um, we've worked um, really hard on the film. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a roller coaster of emotions, but it's one worth watching. Um, working at the magazine, just living life. Nice. Not, well, it's a it's a great journey. Yes, it's it a great journey. We definitely appreciate you taking the time to come out and talk with us and recognize. You know, it can happen to anybody. Yes. You know, so it does not discriminate. No, um, we definitely just need to make sure that we reach out mm -hmm. and ask the question. Yep. Ask the question. So yeah. don't be afraid to. Um, you know, it, it doesn't take much just to say, Hey, you yeah. know, I need a little help. Your silence will never protect you. No, your silence will never keep you safe. No. Um, yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. So again, I'm thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Um, and be sure to visit us online at www.tbhcares.org. We will definitely have more information on Emma's story on there and where you could, um, even, you know, visit her site from there. So uh, you, you definitely want to view the documentary. Yes. Um, you need some tissues, but it's a, it's a good story. It's a great journey. Um, and we're excited to, to be a part of it. Yes, ma'am. So. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And mm -hmm. obviously thank you for bringing me out here. And now think, she's going to move here. Yeah. I think she's convinced me to move. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you so much. Thank and you. we will see you next week. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.